And uh, my question, the first question comes in two parts. The Pittman Grove Beach Community Association requests that the Shire of Capel moves a motion that receives the CHR map report for information only and that any implementation of matters arising from the report only be done after extensive and thorough consultation with members of the community. And the second part of that is the Shire, we acknowledge the Shire has no intent to apply for an additional discretionary rate levy on ratepayers in Pepin Grove Beach or Dal Yellup. Do you want me to ask the second question now? Um, I'll just, if I can just address the first question first, I guess it was actually requesting us to consider a motion. Um, we don't have the provisions within our standing orders to be take to take motions from the floor. Um, so I ask us obviously to note the suggested motion that you've got here and we can't um, move second and debate that in this forum. Um, but as mentioned in the earlier questions regarding the chair map, so the chair map will be presented to council for endorsement once the consultation period has um, concluded and those amendments have been made. It will then be presented to council for endorsement and that will be the opportunity to consider the arrangements with further community consultation over the implementation of the recommendations from that chair map. Um, all options and recommendations in the chair map, uh, including avenues on how to raise mitigation funding and, and we'll discuss with the community, um, be carefully assessed um, and any decisions on how to, uh, how any mitigated, mitigation funds may be raised is still a very long way away. Well, why then was the original proposal that the re residents of Pebman Grove Beach alone be responsible for raising the money? Um, I might ask the CEO if he would like to make comment on that. Uh, through you, presiding member. <clears throat> the uh, Water Technologies, the consultant engaged to prepare the, um, the draft chair map for, by the Perrin Naturalist Partnership, um, were instructed by the state government who set the framework for the chair map to do a pilot on um, how effectively a, a, a locally generated levy might raise mitigation funds. Peppermint Grove Beach, from our understanding, was chosen arbitrarily for that pilot. The Shire had no influence over that decision. Um, it was just that the consultant was asked to basically do a, a cost-benefit analysis on um, a locally generated levy and the decision was made at that time to choose Peppermint Grove Beach. That's as much as we know. Um, that is not an indication in any way of what the future might look like. Thank you for that. The second question is <coughs> the um, Peppermint Grove Community Association requests that the Shire of Capel develop a policy to mitigate any climate change consequences into the future and I don't believe they have one at this stage. Uh, so the Shire of Capel has a, um, a councillor committee, the Climate Change and Adaptation and Sustainability Committee uh, and that committee has actually developed a sustainability framework and there has been um, some um, policies in the past. There's also been a declaration um, of recognition of the impacts of climate change that has on our work as a, as a local government and how we deliver our services and how we protect our community. So those things have occurred over time. Um, I'm proud to have been on that committee um, for probably about four years now um, and still currently on that committee. Um, so, and, and just in detail, um, so the goal of the framework is to uh, establish the parameters to assess the locally specified risks associated with climate change and implications for our services and identify areas where appropriate mitigation and or adaption strategies should be developed and implemented. Monitor the progress of our adaptation and mitigation actions and communicate our achievements to neighbouring councils, state and federal governments and the community. Collaborate across local governments and state government to manage the risks of climate change. Uh, and well, regional climate change, ensure local government policies and regulations incorporate uh, climate change considerations and are consistent with state federal climate <coughs> policies, build resilience and adaptive capacity in local community, 
including providing information about climate change risks, build partnerships with communities and relevant um, non-government agents, uh, officers, or agencies, businesses and others to manage climate change risks and impacts, prepare, prepare prevent, respond and recover from detrimental climate impacts. Um, so following the endorsement of the sustainability framework by Council, um, a corporate, uh, corporation adaptation action plan will be developed to identify the specific actions that the Shire can take to manage the risks and adapt to the impacts of climate change on the Shire's own operational facilities and how the Shire might advocate for and support the community-based action um, will also be included. Thank you, Mr Chairman, for your detailed reply. Edward and Deborah Pixton. No? Um, they, did, they did submit their questions, so I will read them, read them for the room. Um, it's regarding extracti extraction of sand on Duquesne Road. Question one, uh, with the Shire doing a backflip on regarding the extraction of sand from Duquesne Road sand pit, there was no consideration about the upkeep of the roads that are going to take the above normal traffic and also the residents who live in the area. These roads are Duquesne Road, Quillup Road and Lilydale. Uh, as we are going to experience increased traffic with no roadworks for these roads and whenever there is anything done in this area, which is seldom, um, it is only a Band-Aid fix. Um, and our, uh, the question, the application um, was lodged and determined by JDAP. The Shire's role and responsibility with, uh, within a JDAP process is to assess the application and to provide recommendation contained uh, in the responsible authority report. Through this process, it became apparent that concerns relating to proposal may be addressed through the imposition of planning conditions, hence why the recommendation was amended. By conditioning that the applicant to provide a road deterioration co-contribution for the sealed sections of the network along with a request to upkeep the unsealed road network uh, to the satisfaction of the Shire, the proposed number of trucks to and from the site would mean that the road network will be properly maintained and be safe for other users. Uh, and the second question was, why can't sand be extracted also from Harewoods Road sandpit? Um, and that is not considered a plausible solution given the applicant and operator have no connection to the owner of that land in question. I have a question from Teresa Horsfall. Good evening. Uh, my question is regard to the um, extractive licence um, in the sandpit in Skippings Road. We are the lucky property that's 106 metres from this. The properties surrounding the proposed site are zone rural. Our property bounded by this proposed site was purchased as a horse riding establishment and we also breed horses. How will the proponent protect our valuable horses from breathing the silica dust and drinking the contaminated water? Horses, question number two, horses are flight response animals and noise and machine movements are unsettling for them. As the working hours are proposed to be from 7 a.m. to 5 a.m. and Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., will the proponent stop work to allow us to deal safely with our horses? Thank you. Um, so uh, again, so the Shire is still assessing the application uh, and will submit a responsible authority report to JDAP for their determination. Um, the Shire report and any recommendations will take into account several referral comments, uh, including information from the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. Um, we recommend yourself and anyone <laughs> as well um, is able to request a deputation at the JDAP meeting so that the applicant can provide a response to each of the concerns raised. Uh, and the Shire will also assess the application and, if appropriate, um, may recommend the imposition of, uh, of a planning condition uh, which will limit the operation hours of the proposal. Any recommendation would be generally consistent with past approvals for the extractive industry applications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Horsfall. Hi. I've also got a question um, about the sand mine on Skippings Road. My address is also, it's only five, eight, it's 
587 Brookdale Road in Boyna, which is only 106 metres from our house to the proposed mine site. This address is registered with the Department of Education to provide two children with an education. The noise associated with a mine site at such close proximity to a school site will impact the children's education. Can the Shire give details of the law regarding school sites and proximity to extractive industries? Um, thank you for the question. So as I discussed earlier, there is um, provisions around the distance and the buffers between sensitive land uses. Uh, and then under the Environmental Protection Authority, uh, which has prepared the guiding document for assessment of environmental factors associated with the separation distance between sensitive land uses, which have been 300 to 500 metres to sensitive land uses, depending on the size and the nature of the operation, um, with key impacts associated with the operations being noise and dust. Um, again, the Shire is obviously assessing the application um, and will finalise our responsible authority report um, once all the external state government referral agencies have done so. Okay, thank you, because it is quite a big problem with my children's specific learning program. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And um, again, I think I say, um, obviously, we are here and obviously not a determining agent, uh, the determining body in this case, but obviously people are raising the concerns with us and we're making note and councillors are here listening as well. Um, Kelvin Napton. Thank you, presiding member. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, Quillop Road, with relation to the MGM uh, extraction, was constructed and bitumised to allow for the movement of light vehicles and farmers' trucks, keeping in mind the size and weight of these farmers' trucks when it was bitumised. These vehicles would have probably had a gross weight not exceeding eight tonnes, with the occasional, and I say very occasional, semi-trailer movement back in those days of having a gross weight around 18 tonnes. The width of the bitumen, the width of the road shoulders and the closeness of the vegetation to the edges of the road are further proof that this road is simply not designed for the purpose for which it is now used. We've been residents of Quillop Road for approximately seven years. When we, <coughs> when we first moved in, I was constantly reminded of the semi-rural nature of the area by the continual movement of people on foot, people on foot walking their dogs, and people riding horses on Quillop Road. This people movement provided a genuine country feel to the area and resulted in a number of friendships being made. We now, thanks to the backflip by the Capel Shire and the outcome of M MGM's appeal to the rubber stamp of JDAP, forced to surrender all of our freedoms on the altar of the almighty dollar. The almighty dollar. Quillop Road the one which was constructed for light vehicles and farmers' trucks, is now a highway for some 30 semi-trailer movements per hour. These vehicles have a gross weight around 45 tonnes, over five tonnes of the weight used in the calculations when constructing and bitumising quill up. The 30 semi-trailer movements per hour does not, does not take into account the number of service vehicles, water trucks, heavy floats and other assorted vehicles utilised in the quarrying operation. The effect on Quillop Road has been nothing other than disastrous to this point with an outlook of only further destruction ahead. A fleeting inspection of Quillop Road will show clearly that the bitumen is suffering very noticeable tram line effect whereby the road is being compacted where the Trailers, where the wheels of the trailers and the trucks travel, thereby leaving large wheel ruts longitudinally in the road. <coughs> the road shoulders are being destroyed by the constant need for trucks and vehicles being forced to move off the bitumen to pass each other due to the narrow nature of the road. The bitumen surface is being potholed by the heavy vehicle movements. Uh, this current scale of degradation on Quill Up will only increase with the increased heavy vehicle movements as approved. My question is, as there has been extremely little maintenance, uh, maintenance work on Quill Up Road to this point, 
and I have to reiterate extremely little to this point, what is proposed for the future and is there any provision for the owners of the quarry to financially assist with the maintenance? Now with that in mind, I note your earlier comments. Do we have any dollar figures from the MGM? Uh, yeah, so I'll try and I'll answer the first question and try and elaborate if I, I can for you as well. So um, obviously Quill Up Road and other parts of the haulage route um, have fallen into a state of disrepair um, and was subsequently closed for a period of time. Um, an offer was made to the Shire where the applicant would cover the costs and upkeep uh, the state of the road themselves, leaving the liability with the applicant rather than the Shire. Uh, this offer was not accepted and ultimately the responsibility um, has fallen onto the Shire. Uh, there was also no collection uh, of a road deterioration co-contribution for the upkeep, um, upkeeping the sealed parts of the haulage route. Um, shire officers believe that the state of disrepair for aspects of the haulage route were more so due to the lack of maintenance and compliance inspections rather than the number of trucks being run to and from the site. Both issues have since been addressed through the imposition of conditions on the latest JDAP approval. Um, Quill Up Road is classified as an access road um, in accordance to Main Road WA's HSV network um, and has no restricted access um, has no restricted access vehicle status, um, and thus the semi-trailers um, can legally access the road. Um, in April 2023, traffic counts um, do not indicate any issues with speed or traffic with traffic counters recording an operating speed of 68 kilometres per hour and traffic volumes of 229 vehicle um, per day, uh, with AM and PM peaks of 36 vehicles and 34 vehicles respectively occurring midweek on Tuesday and Wednesday at 3 p.m. and 11 a.m. Now we understand obviously the most of the trucks um, and the maintenance intervals need to increase to ensure the road safety is not compromised. Additionally, Quill Up Road, along with other Shire roads affected by the increased extractive industry traffic, um, will be monitored annually and, where required, submitted for upgrades and or rehabilitation works via the annual works program. I may just ask the CEO if he can elaborate on what the conditions were um, from the JDAP approval in the case that they may um, provide some assistance with the second part of that question around um, potential monies from the applicant. Uh, three, presiding member. So yes, as, as the presiding member outlined, <coughs> a, a previous offer by the operator to the Shire to maintain Quill Up Road in the borough was, was not accepted by the Shire. However, the recent JDAP um, approval included a, uh, a, a condition whereby a co-contribution from the operator to the Shire for the maintenance of that road is now conditioned as part of the approval. <coughs> so the Shire will take that into account and use that money to improve the maintenance of Quill Up Road and the associated roads around the operation. So what, <coughs> what is that co-contribution? Uh, through the Shire, uh, presiding member, we'd have to take that part of notice. Yeah, can take that spot. Yeah, take that. Because part my understanding of the JDAP was that they their offer was on Duquesne Road to re to uh, resurface Duquesne. There well, was no mention in the JDAP, in the JDAP meeting of Quill Up. We'll take that part on notice so that we can perhaps provide you with a response with the questions around the monies available um, to the Shire through the co-contribution. Um, and I note that you've got a second question as well. Correct. Quarry extraction times. Current times allow for this to commence at 7am. Regularly, we have several of the semi-trailers lined up at Lilydale Road intersection as early as eight minutes to seven. Now to allow for time for loading, time for travel, and if you say they are travelling at 68 kilometres an hour, I would suggest you recalibrate your, um, your uh, counter as well as put it in place full time so that you have an accurate rather than a spot uh, assessment of what's going on. Um, for, trucks to be, for that number of trucks to be at the Lilydale Road intersection at that time, they would need to be starting considerably before 7 a.m. This matter has been brought to the attention of the Cable Shire on several occasions formally. Uh, a former member of the Shire, Mark Tullican, um, I can only pat him on the back, a shame that he left. 
at least this matter, however, since he's leaving, since he's leaving the Shire, this matter appears to be ignored. The problem we have, emails and phone calls to the Shire requesting policing of this matter have remained unanswered. Meanwhile, the blatant disregard for times shown by MGM continues. My question is, is it possible to have Shire staff respond and also respond in a timely manner to emails, phone calls from ratepayers? Thank you. Well, I will make, we will make note um, of your comments regarding um, response times and your experience in that nature. Um, and obviously, we will always strive to ensure that um, emails or correspondence are reviewed um, and investigated and responded to promptly. Um, I think the best we can do in this situation, in this forum, is to obviously take that on note um, and um, hope that we can do better at responding to you in a more promptly, uh, prompt fa fashion. Thank you. Uh, Bob Horsfall. Good evening, Mr Chairman. In, again, in regard to sand extraction proposal at Lot 148 Skippings Road in Boynup, first question is, the proposal doesn't clearly state how this site will be revegetated. Can the Shire explain this process and will the Shire guarantee it will be successful? The second question is, the law states a dwelling must be 500 metres away from a mine site. My home is 106 metres from the proposed mine site. How will the proponent stop the silica sand getting into my rainwater tanks? The third question is, how will the proponent protect my family and allow them to continue to work and ride their horses on the property? Thank you for the question. Um, so the Shire would seek that any approval would include a condition that requires that any revegetation would be detailed in a comprehensive rehabilitation implementation plan to be submitted and approved by the Shire uh, before development commences. The rehabilitation plan would be monitored for compliance and completion and I understand that we um, also um, keep a rehabilitation bond Yep, and in this case we would have a rehabilitation bond so and that's to protect us in the instance where the applicant doesn't rehabilitate the site um, that they do not receive that bond until the work is done and in the case that it's not there is funds to do so. Um, I think I've heard loud and clear the concerns tonight regarding the um, distance from the land uses um, and again all I can say is obviously what is in within the EPA guidelines but um, I think it's been made loud and clear to the people in this room tonight the concerns regarding that um, and of course again you know council um, is still considering it's uh, not council sorry the Shire um, is considering obviously its submission to be made as a responsible authority report. Thank you. I've seen photos that uh, show the revegetation would resemble a Bali resort. Thank you. <laughs> not sure how to take that as a negative or, or a positive <laughs> comment, <laughs> depending, on, depending on your taste of holiday. Um, so off, off topic, but um, next question from Neil David. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, good evening, Shire President, CEO and councillors. My name's Penny David. I'm Neil's wife and I live at 476 Brookdale Road with my uh, two daughters and stepson. And we've got concerns about the development application at Skippings Road as well. We'd like to know two things. Um, we'd like to know the method of construction of this proposed protection mound and the long-term control of dust and grassing of the mound. Is the, is the mound supposed to control sound and visual disturbance as well as suppress the dust? And our concern is that it's constructed properly and maintained properly so that watering and grassing occurs to prevent floating particles. And if there are floating particles of dust or silica, what are the long-term effects of inhaling and drinking these particles? The second um, point to make is, what is the proposed routine of watering of hall roads during the extraction process 
where is the water going to be taken from and what is the frequency of watering? What contingency is in place for the ongoing maintenance over Easter breaks, high wind times, Christmas and holidays and evening periods? Should the project commence, a dust monitor for floating particles needs to be in place at least six months prior to, to gather baseline data prior to commencement of any works. We're aware that silica is carcinogenic and we have asked for two months um, for the matrix of the sand that is being extracted and we haven't been able to get that um, as yet. So the Shire, how does the Shire propose to manage the mound and dust control and could we please have the sand matrix urgently? Thank you for the question. So the applicant um, proposes to construct a two metre high temporary bunding which will consist of topsoil uh, in two locations. Uh, the intent of the bund uh, buns is to mitigate uh, noise and dust impacts from the operations. Uh, the locations of the buns reflects recommendations of um, an acoustics assessment. That forms part of the application. Uh, advice from government agencies has been requested to assist assessing the suitability of the buns and their maintenance. Uh, and we obviously are awaiting that advice. Um, and then your second question, um, the application proposed to JDAP um, is also supported by a dust management plan. The plan includes proposed methods of dust prevention, dust monitoring and mitigations and, um, and a process of addressing complaints. The proposed dust prevention methods include staging of development to limit exposed areas, limiting vehicle speeds to 20 kilometres per hour, having a water cart capacity greater than 10,000 litres being available, and the covering of vehicles. Unfortunately, I don't seem to ha um, have the information on hand about the regularity of the watering, but only the capacity. Uh, additional dust monitoring and mitigation is identified in the plan following observation of activities. Identified mitigation options including seizing activities when water conditions are creating off-site dust, uh, dust nuisance, use of dust suppressants on the topsoil bund and installation of dust fencing. <coughs> Advice from government agencies has been requested again to assist with the Shire's assessment of the dust management plan. Okay, so the 20 kilometres per hour, is that on site or off site? I understand that will be on site. And the, the 10,000 litres, is that just meant to be available at any time? So there's no frequency stated? No, so I don't have any information on the frequency. Yep. Um, all I can say is that they have to have a water, um, water cart with a capacity that's greater than 10,000 And litres. is there anything that, that says in there that, um, that the water cart is required at a certain trigger point when the certain a number of particles are in the air? With, with the information that I've got in front of me, I couldn't tell you what that is. Um, but obviously, dust monitoring takes place and they can monitor with... Um, with the monitors in certain areas and they can identify when dust is above a certain level than, or they can see increases or spikes in that. Um, I can't probably elaborate too much more or from my understanding um, or from the information that I've got here um, as to the frequency or the level in which that reaction occurs. So how would we get access to um, what they're proposing in terms of dust monitoring and the ongoing monitoring so instead I'm of periodic monitoring, which is no not, it's not relevant. Yeah, so, under, so the dust management plan um, is included within the application, so I'm sure that there should be access to that, and I may just refer this question, the remainder of this question to the CEO for him to make comment as well. Um, thank you, presiding member. So once the date for the actual JDAP panel meeting has been set, um, the agenda will then be released publicly, as well as the application and all supporting documentation. At that point, the public will be able to access and review themselves the proposed dust management plan. So I guess we're unable to um, answer some of those questions for you tonight, um, but certainly once the panel meeting is set, the documents are available to everyone um, and you'll be able to look at the dust management plan yourself and hopefully answer those questions. If those questions aren't answered, you can request a deputation at the JDAP meeting and ask the applicant yourself. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Um, question from Cathy Thompson. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman, um, CEO, councillors. You guys know me already. So 
I'm not going to read from what I've prepared. You actually have a copy of what I've prepared. Straight away, it's obvious there is a house right next door to the mine site. There's another house very close to the mine site. There are two other houses a little bit further away, possibly more than, they're around about 500 metres away. So straight away there's a problem. Uh, you've also heard uh, the activities that go on in the area around the, uh, the proposed mine. And it's already very clear to me that we do not have enough information. Uh, we are meant to submit to JDAP by the 9th of June. We have literally nine days to prepare a submission and we do not have information. We don't have the sand matrix. We don't have the detailed dust plans. Virtually, as Penny said, we have very little information. So I'm asking the Shire, A, to request more information, uh, particularly the core samples, uh, wind direction and um, the, uh, the dust mitigation strategies. We need more information. I'm asking the Shire, how will you assist us to get the information and, how w and will you assist us to apply for an extension on our submissions? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So on the first part of how the Shire will assist, so the Shire is enabled one opportunity under the Planning and Development Regulations of 2015 to request further information from an applicant throughout the JDAP, uh, JDAP development application process. Shire officers will wait until all state government referral agency comments have been received as well as all submissions from the community before determining whether any additional or further information is required. Understanding, of course, that this is a um, process that is managed by the department and not by the Shire, um, JDAP process and timelines are outside of the Shire's control. Should the requ Shire request any further information as outlined um, in the previous response, the applicant may choose to agree to stop the clock in accordance with Clause 65B of the Planning Development Regulations, but under no obligation to do so. Any stop the clock or extension of time is the decision of the applicant, and they are under no obligation to provide this to the Shire. The Shire encourages each interested member of the community to submit any information or concerns in a formal submission to the JDAP to assist in the determination process. Furthermore, there is an opportunity to request a deputation at the JDAP meeting, as we've heard on a number of occasions tonight. The applicant may then be posed questions related to the information requested above and as part of the deputation process. Um, and I just want to reiterate, of course, that um, within question time tonight, I feel the community has painted uh, a picture around the challenges with this particular, or the concerns, I should say, around this particular application and obviously um, respect the fact that their um, council is not the determining agency in this case. Um, but I think, as I've said <coughs> here in this, in this response as well, council will not make um, its submission um, until other submissions from all other state agencies are received and community comments as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes all the questions I've received. Um, however, um, I know it has been a long question time, but I will, of course, take um, some questions from the floor. Do I have any questions from the floor? Yes, and just if you could please give us your name and locality as well when you come to the stand. Uh, my name is Don Finley, uh, cattle veterinarian, Southwest WA. I've attended uh, a few of the question periods here over the last year. Sorry to extend the question period, but I have two questions. Um, and just kind of pinch yourselves as a counselor or staff in your chair. Does anyone know the number of carcasses 
removed from the board up sales yards over the past year, the year before, the year before that, and the year before that one. And if so, I would acknowledge anybody who does. So only the, the president uh, will be acting the chair and um, through the chair the CEO can respond to a question. I will say um, I'm not on the top of my head and not aware of the exact number of carcasses that have been removed from the sale yards myself. Um, unless the CEO would like to add. Uh, three is uh, presiding member. Um, it's a requirement of the WA Livestock Association to report annually on their operations and that includes fatalities of any livestock at the sale yards. So whilst I don't have that information at hand, that information is certainly available from the department uh, as part of the returns and information provided by WALSA to the department. Uh, and your second question? Well, I just want a bit of an explanation. You said the Western Australian stock what was it? So, so he's referring to WALSA, the West Australian Livestock Association? Oh, certainly. Yep. Yes, well, <clears throat> I have the compliance reports here over that period, and I would like them. I don't know if we can table them, but I'd like a copy at least to go to each council member. So I don't have the provisions within standing orders to necessarily table them. Um, but of course, you're welcome through all our communication methods to um, send a copy of that report to all councillors, um, which can be done through the website or it can be sent to info at capal.wa.gov.au. Um, we've um, noticed for councillors to, re to receive. Right. Well... The smallest number of carcasses disposed of was eight. Uh, the largest number was 14. Um, these compliance report forms include the discharge violations and other issues that WALSA has <coughs> over the years been reporting. Um, so the second question, um, well, let me first clear it that I photocopy these and email them to each staff of the, of the Shire and, and each councillor. Is that what you're saying? So you're more than welcome to provide copies to councillors tonight. Um, we can't table them in the actual meeting themselves, um, but you are welcome to, as councillors are accessible to all community members, to provide them to any councillors or all councillors you wish. Um, I suggest one of the best ways to do so is to email a copy of that um, to all councillors, which you can do through that email address, info at capal.wa.gov.au, um, or otherwise, perhaps if you do have multiple copies, could say you can welcome to leave some in the room and councillors can pick them up after the meeting. Yeah, there's four reports. So um, they are signed and redacted on the signatures except for the 2022 report, which uh, was 10 carcasses up until the 30th of September 2022. And, and sorry, do you, and so is there, do you still have a second question? Well, I'm, the, the question regards DPIRD and WALSA media releases last year that referenced two or three deaths. So I'll take that as a comment that, that you're refuting the well, the, uh, the question is, why have we got this discrepancy when we have data yep. that says more animals were disposed of as carcasses than what's reported by either the government agency or WALSA? Yep. As you've 
as you've mentioned, that was obviously a release from the government agency and WALSA, um, and the government agency is the one who oversees those operations. Um, so we will make note of your comments regarding that. Yeah, they're not on site, uh, and there's no requirement for any stock operations to report deaths to DIPPER. That's in the legislation. Do we have any more questions from the floor tonight? No? Or, um, oh, sorry. understand um, obviously thank um, that concludes question time and I'll just give a few moments for those who wish to leave after question time to, to do so Um, applications for leave of absence. Do I have any applications for leave of absence? Sorry, excuse me, sorry, we'll have to... Councillor Noonan. I have to, sorry. Applications for leave of absence. Councillors. Applications for leave of absence. Um, do I have any applications for leave of absence? No, there are none. Uh, declarations of interest. Um, I've not received any declarations of interests. Does anyone need to identify any interests? Uh, notices of items to be discussed behind closed doors. I have none. Uh, confirmation of the minutes uh, and the officer's recommendation has been amended um, that the minutes of the ordinary meeting of council 26th of April 2023 be confirmed as a true and correct record with the correction to include the recording of the electronic attendance of Councillor Mogg under 14C of the Local Government Administration Regulations of 1996. Uh, do I have a mover? Councillor Andrew. And a seconder? Councillor Dillon. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Uh, all those in favour? And Councillor Terentroy? In favour? Yep. Uh, they are carried unanimously. Uh, minutes of the special council meeting, 8th of May. Um, there has been an amendment to this as well, uh, that the minutes of the special council meeting, 8th of May 2023, be confirmed as a true and correct record with the correction to include the recording of the electronic attendance of the Director, Infrastructure and Development, Tanya Gillett, under 14C of the Local Government Administration Regulation and uh, 1996. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Noonan and a seconder, Councillor McCleary. Is there any discussion on those minutes? No. Uh, I have a question, Councillor Andrew. Can we... Do we have uh, right immediately, right now, or <laughs> have I got? Did we have the copies of the? I think we were getting some physical ones. Yeah, we've got a physical copy. So, I'll take that as a question, and I'll respond to the question. <laughs> um, so, the only correction in those minutes um, is to include um, the director of infrastructure and developments. Um, attendance as being electronic um, and we do have a I do believe that we have a copy of those minutes so I'll just provide you a physical copy question councillor Mogg um, yes I understand they have yes yep Um, 
Um, so Councillor Andrew has received a copy of the minutes with the correction made. Um, Councillor McCleary, you had your hand up. No, they haven't. Um, and the situation that we have here is that we're not just endorsing a change set of minutes, we are endorsing the minutes with the change being made. So the minutes that were in the agenda and that are on the website are the minutes that need the correction and that's why the motion is worded in the way that we are approving the correction to the minutes. From my rec recollection, the um, Director of Infrastructure and Development didn't attend the entire meeting via telephone. She, we phoned her mid-meeting and then she left. What we've done is noted her as a permanent person that's present rather than logging her coming in and going back out like we have done with Councillor Noonan. So, and I'll seek some further information from the CEO, but I understood and from noting when the minutes were taken that there was, t there should be time in there from where the director entered the room and exited the room. You're saying that's missing? Okay. Um, so, CEO seeking advice on this. Um, if the time's not in there, unless anyone has off the, um, we have to review the recording and see what time the, um, that occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, through you then, presiding member, we might propose uh, an amendment to the officer's recommendation then to say that the minutes of the special council meeting 8 May 2023 be confirmed as true and accurate record, um, with the correction to include the uh, recording of the electronic attendance under um, and including the accurate time that the director joined and left the meeting. So we'd have to go back and uh, identify those exact times by the audio recording. So, and responding to Councillor Andrew, so um, noting that um, an, am an additional amendment would be needed in order to um, change that wording or to add clarity around the time in which the director entered and exited the meeting. Um, it is up to council to um, to make that consideration, unless, of course, we have exact details handy to us as to what those times were, which... Yeah, can I just ask the CEO to comment in regards to that on what the exact timing was? Uh, three presiding members, so the director has a record of the time when she joined the meeting, um, which was 6.38pm, and the call duration was for 37 minutes, so that would mean that the director left the meeting at 7.05. So if councillor happy, then that would be recorded in the recommender, in the now, I still think that, um, yeah, Councillor Andrew, I think we still, um, and I'll get back to you, I think that still requires an amendment um, to include that, but you had another question? It's more a comment. Yeah, I'll Be take this as your contribution to discussion, <laughs> though. <laughs> because these run as a, as a run sheet, we don't know at what point in the meeting, at what item, those times occurred, if that makes sense. So these are via item numbers. Without actually reviewing the recording of this whole meeting, we don't know at what point we were up to at six, whatever those times were, and then the time that she left, if that makes sense. 
So there's still no guarantee that it's going to be slotted in accurately unless we actually review the recording. So I, um, well actually I can't speak because I can't respond to a question, so I'll take that um, on comment and I'll use this as my opportunity to speak. Um, so council would need to withdraw the recommendation so that it can come back to council with um, amended wording. Um, and I just need to seek some advice on the withdrawal. Because um, it can't be it can't be deferred because the item that comes back to council has to be identical to the one that has been deferred, um, and so I would need to um, withdraw the item. I also believe that if the item is simply defeated, that in that case um, there it would be a, a non-decision, and so there's no um, there's no decision for. Um, can I defer it with with changes? So if, can we defer it with come back with? Can I seek? I'm going to seek advice from the CEO on the best matter to approach this. Councillor Noonan, um, just return. So I'm going to move to defer the item um, and defer it with comment um, included in the deferral motion um, that it be deferred until the next meeting, um, next ordinary meeting of council, so that the time and item in which the director um, attended and left the meeting by electronic means can be recorded, um, can be provided to the meet, um, to the item. Yep, um, okay. Which is a... um, okay, so I haven't seek to move uh, or put that deferral on the floor, uh, but I am going to move um, to suspend standing orders um, 10.1, um, order and call in debate. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Noonan. Um, and that's moved by myself. Um, all those in favour? Um, Councillor Terran Troy? Yes, in favour. Yep, that is unanimous to that is unanimous to suspend standing orders ten point one. Yes. So I'm gonna ask the CEO to provide explanation. So the Microphone. Um, Councillors, the current minute says they are published. Um, indicate that the council decision, which was in relation to um, the confidential item, which was the tender for the Southwest Regional Waste Management Service, um, the motion was put um, at to go behind closed doors to consider, given that was a, there were confidential attachment. That was recorded in the minutes at 6:36. At that time. The director was contacted at 6.38. Councillor Noonan left the meeting at 6.37. So the uh, identification of the director joining the meeting would be immediately after the recording of council 
Council and Noonan leaving and returning at 6.37. Uh, so that would be recorded at 7.05. Um, and that would be um, basically prior. So the motion to move from behind closed doors was at 7.16. So it would be recorded prior to that in the minutes. Thank you, councillors. Um, unless there's anyone who wishes to speak while standing orders have been suspended, um, I'll move otherwise. Councillor Mogg? Microphone, please. Thank you. Just let the presiding member and staff know that um, contacted through the IT YouTube channel's not working, but the website is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. Um, I do believe that the audio input issue was resolved. Mm -hmm. um, councillors will note that there is a, a stream at the moment, but it is on the website, but it's not on the YouTube. So we'll we've had some issues with the YouTube. Yeah, um, it is working yep. on the website. So, so this the meeting is accessible and still being live streamed um, at the moment, which is important. Um, I will move to reinstate standing orders 10.1. Do I have a mover? Councillor Noonan again, and every uh, all those in favour? And Councillor Terran Troy. In favour. Yep. That is passed unanimously to reinstate standing orders. I admit I've lost a little bit of track of who was speaking. Was there anyone else who? So sorry. Firstly, um, I, just, I was speaking, and just in conclusion. Um, if a councillor wishes to, they can obviously move an amendment now to include the times of entry and departure. Um, the rest, the correction in the minutes still remains, I think, the same in which that um, the attendance was by electronic means. Um, perhaps for, to make this a little easier, perhaps I'll move the amendment. Um, so I will move an amendment um, just to adding to the current officer's recommendation that is currently on the table, um, notes the um, notes that the director um, entered the meeting at 6:38 p.m. and left the meeting at 7:05 p.m. Um, and do you, can someone tell? Me the item, the exact item number off the top of the head? Uh, 9.1. During item 9.1. Sorry, and that should be, the wording actually probably should be um, records that the director entered the meeting at 6.38 p.m. and left the meeting at 7.05 p.m during item 9.1. That is the amendment to add that. So my maths is not good, that should be 7.15. 7.15 p.m., sorry. Um, 7.15 p.m. Um, do I have a second? So this, so the amendment is to add an additional point, which is um, presented in front of council. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Mogg? Um, I don't wish to make any additional comment on that. Councillor Mogg, do you wish to have anything to say? No. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on the amendment? No. In that case, all those in favour? Uh, Councillor Terran Troy? In favour? Yep. Uh, the amendment is passed unanimously and becomes the subsequent motion. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the Officers, the subsequent motion that has not spoken yet. No. Um, can I just have a reminder of who, who moved the minutes? Yeah. Councillor Noonan, as the mover um, of the officer's recommendation, do you have anything else to add? No. All those in favour? And Councillor Taran Troy, this is to adopt these meetings of the special council meeting. In favour? That is unanimous. 
Item 9, announcements by person presiding without discussion. You will notice that the Shire President has attached um, their Shire President activity report for the March-May period. That is noted in the agenda. Also like to note that on May 22nd, 2023, the Shire President, Councillor Doug Kitchen, advised Council that he would be unavailable from the 22nd of May, 2023 until the 28th of May. In accordance with section 5.34 subclause B of the Local Government Act 1995, the Deputy President, myself, is authorised to act in his place. On Friday the 26th of May, the Shire President advised Council that he was extending this period until June 2nd. We congratulate Councillor Kitchen and his wife Erin on welcoming their third child during this time. As per the authorisation of the Shire President, um, I will obviously and am obviously chairing this evening's Ordinary Council meeting and let the minutes show that during this period I have acted under delegation on three occasions, signing three caveats on the Friday, two on Friday the 26th of May and another today. Um, We also have um, a request for a presentation um, that is not a deputation and presentation in regards to an agenda item tonight from Mr George Turner. And I will um, invite Mr George Turner to um, come up to the stand to make his um, brief presentation. Thank you. Evening Acting President and fellow councillors and the CEO for the Shire of Capel. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm here representing the grand, great grandchildren of James and Emma Turner. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the research and dedication of Owen Ireland, new Turner, to this book and being the eldest daughter of Jamesy and Lil Turner. And Jamesy was virtually in charge of the butcher shop here in Capel for many, many years. Also acknowledge the technical and production knowledge of Brian Turner, the youngest son of Charlie and Lillian Turner. This book is the history of James and Emma Turner, who was a dilly. And the book even goes back further than that to the 1560s. Great grandfather, James was born in 1842 in Bordock, Hertfordshire. James, along with two others, was convicted for arson, burning down a barn where a cow, horse and pigs were burnt to death, therefore being sent to jail and eventually being transported on a convict ship called the Racehorse in May 1865. Great-grandfather James married Emma, on the 6th of August, 1875, in Bosselin. From the marriage, there was 13 children, of which 11 survived to adult age. One of the children was grandfather, Frederick Henry, who married Fanny Shortland on the 12th of October, 1922, at St John's Church, Cable. From this marriage, there was a total of 12 children overall, of which eight survived to adults, and a set of twins and two other children were still born. Surviving children were James Henry, Jamesy, Fanny Henrietta, Etty, Charles Frederick, Charlie, Clarence William, Clary, who became a highly decorated SAS soldier during the Second World War. Marjorie, who was known as Marge, Edwin Keith, we knew as Keith, Raymond George, my father, known as George, and Mavis Irene as Mavis. The family had a connection with the butchering business in Cable for a number of decades. The first butcher shop was, born, uh, was, the first butcher shop was built in 1908, the second in 1927, and the third in 1935 and these premises were demolished around 2005 due to the asbestos in the construction. This all took place on the triangular block alongside the bakers where they operate today. A slaughterhouse 
today known as an abattoir, operated approximately 300 metres from the Bustle Highway where it sits today, along Malacup Road on the left heading towards Capel Vale Wines. The family home of Frederick and Fanny is a place where the Colruy Two Rooms now operates. Although it may be hard for some to imagine that this was a strongly constructed brick home for a big family. And out the front of the house was once a big pine tree, which was always the Saturday night get together place before going to dances and parties in the district. Mind you, the pub was just across the road. My father was born in this, in this house. Great grandfather and great grandmother, James and Emma, plus the next generation down of grandfather and grandmother in Frederick Henry and Fanny, along with five of the family, now rest peacefully at the Cable Cemetery. We trust this book to the Shire of Capel Archive Room for safekeeping for future generations and viewing and research and to be placed alongside other families of the districts such as the Paynes, Roberts and Scotts. This is our presentation. Thank you, George, and thank you for that contribution to the Shire's archive rooms as well on your family history. Following on from um, announcements by the person presiding, the Shire of Capel would also like to congratulate local Wadandi elder, custodian and artist Sandra Hill in recently winning the prestigious Red Ochre Award for Outstanding Lifetime Achievement. The national award is presented by the Australian Council for the Arts of recognising a lifetime of contribution to First Nations arts nationally and internationally, a lifetime contribution to the First Nations community and artistic leadership and art practice. Sandra's contribution to First Nations art in Western Australia is unparalleled and of regional, state and national historical significance. For nearly 40 years, she has mentored, influenced and trained emerging First Nations artists, worked in and supported First Nations community organisations and inspired nationally important conversations in truth-telling, culture and contemporary art practices. Her arts practice saw her work featured in the finale of the National Indigenous Triennial and has seen her works acquired by several major galleries and collections in Australia and overseas. Her unique practice has involved working in three streams simultaneously over her career, culturally, cultural immersion, public arts and fine art. Her 52 public artworks interpret significant cultural and historical sites throughout Noongar country and are immense historic value and have responded to and expressed the voice of elders and community through the most important periods in Western Australia. She has recently been recognised for her community contribution taking up leadership roles as a Kerry Carrack Commute Corporation, Southwest Land and Sea Council, Cultural Advice Committee, National Title Prescribed Body Corporate and the Udalup uh, Underlup Association. The Shire congratulates Sandra and recognises her lifetime's work in artistic excellence. Following on from the themes of great work within our Shire, um, Council also wishes to congratulate Jalorup Bushfire Brigade Captain Glenis Malatesta on being announced a finalist for the WAFES Murrayland Bushfire Service Award. Congratulations to Glenis and good luck. And lastly, uh, announcements by the presiding member uh, will acknowledge the birthday of Councillor Cara Andrew uh, on the Monday that has just been. And with that, uh, I will conclude the announcements by presiding member and uh, we will move on to the meeting. Item 10, petitions, deputations and presentations. There are none, motions of which previous notice has been given. There is one, notice of motion delegation 168, execution of certain documents and affixation of common seal. Do I have mover? Councillor Andrew. And a seconder? Councillor Dillon. Uh, Councillor Andrew. 
Thank you. Uh, this just makes life a little bit easier for the signing of um, primarily Landgate documents. Um, so withdrawal of caveats, um, the, the putting on of caveats and the putting on of 70A notifications on to residents' titles. Um, caveats have been put on people's titles um, for a, a number of reasons. Um, ancillary um, accommodation, um, notification that they live in a floodplain, um, and those caveats then need to be lifted if they sell the property to allow settlement to occur, and then either a caveat or a 70A notification has to go back on. Each time that happens, um, the president, our delegation required that the president um, and the CEO apply the common seal to these documents, um, which meant that both of them um, had to be available to sign the document. Um, sometimes these requests come in quite late in the settlement process, um, and so if the documents aren't signed in time, um, it can delay settlement, which then imposes financial penalties um, and that sort of stuff. So our neighbouring shires um, all allow um, the signature of these forms using the 9.49 um, clause. Um, and yeah, it just makes things a little bit more easier. Um, it also means that we don't there's not the same verification of identity requirements for the presidents that obviously can turn over biannually come election time. Um, so it just makes things a little bit simpler. Councillor Dillon, you're the seconder. Do you wish to speak? Uh, only to say that uh, Councillor Andrew took what the words right out of my mouth. Thank you. Is there any other councillors who wish to contribute to the discussion on this item? No, Councillor Andrews, write a reply. Uh, I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? And Councillor Terentroy? Favour. That is passed unanimously. Questions of which previous notice has been given, there is none. Uh, Chief Executive Officer reports 13.1. Uh, Do I have a mover? Councillor Mogg and a seconder. Councillor McCleary. Councillor Mogg. Thank you, presiding member. I accept the motion as read. Thank you. Councillor McCleary? No, reserve your right. Is there any councillors who wish to speak on the item? Uh, Councillor Andrew. Thank you. Um, just I think as a shire, we have to do a better job of engaging um, a range of demographics. Um, this survey has predominantly been filled out by Caucasian people over the age of 60. Um, and while they, I, I, while they represent obviously a portion of our community, um, they don't fill up quite the proportion of our um, community that they represent um, in the survey respondents. Um, so I think we need to do a much better job of engaging with younger generation and younger people and getting them involved in um, surveys and activities that are going to shape um, our community, um, but also um, our residents from other cultures um, and different ethnicities. Thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the item? have none. Does the mover wish to close debate? No. In that case, I'll put it to a vote. All those in favour? Councillor Terentroy? Councillor Terentroy? In favour? The item is carried unanimously. Item 13.2, Draft Economic Development Framework. Do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary, do I have a seconder? Councillor Andrew, Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Um, I moved the motion to red. Councillor Andrew. You wish to speak? No, reserve your right. Is there any councillors who wish to speak on the item? No? I'll give the mover the right of reply. All good? Thank you, Mr President. Um, look, this is, this is a good um, document as probably highlighted by the people in the audience earlier tonight. He's raised some few things in there. Um, I think it's a good map of where we're heading. Um, so, yeah, I totally endorse the, the progress of this item. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I will put that to a vote. Those in favour? Councillor Taryn Troy? In favour? That is carried unanimously. Item 13.3, motions from the 2023 annual meeting of electors. Councillor Mogg has moved the officer's recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Dillon. Councillor Mogg. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I'd like, just like to say that the annual uh, meeting for electors, uh, a favourable meeting of mine being a councillor. These meetings are an opportunity for our residents, our constituents, our community groups to have their voice and concerns put forward. And I ask and remind our fellow councillors to have that support for them. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Acting President. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor Mogg. Uh, it was a good meeting. Uh, it was at the uh, Capel Community Centre this year. Uh, four motions arising out of it, and uh, it's good to see uh, proactive members of our community getting involved in their local council matters. It's uh, good to see. So uh, this is not necessarily saying that they're uh, a fait accompli, but it's the fact that we as a, a council and a shire are, ex are accepting them, and we'll uh, look at them in due course. Thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone who wishes to... Councillor McCleary? Yeah, I had a question on um, point three, just in the use of the uh, community notice boards, whether there was an option to get an earlier activation in that. Um, so the question is in regard to um, an earlier activation of using the notice boards instead of awaiting the review of the communication strategy. Is that correct? Yeah. All right, I'll refer the question to the CEO. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding member. Um, we've, we've taken, I guess, that part of uh, that, that motion was that there wasn't a report to come back to council in any way, so we've interpreted that motion subject to being passed by council tonight that it's something that we can implement straight away. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the item? Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Acting President, and thank you for the CEO for the answer to that question. That's a very promising outcome for that, and as pointed out, it, it's great that people come along to our annual electors meetings and, um, and raise their concerns and actually move motions. Also take note of the vote of appreciation for staff that was moved to that motion, so it was recognition for staff, and that's uh, very commendable. Um, there's a couple of other items in there that I expect we'll get back later on, which um, may have some budget implications. Um, but yeah, look, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're going to move something on those uh, use of those community notice boards. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on the item? No? Uh, I'll give the mover the opportunity to reply. No? All good. All right. I will put that to a vote. All those in favour? Councillor Terran Troy? In favour. That is carried unanimously. Uh, item 14.1, policy review crossovers. Do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Dillon. Councillor McCleary. Uh, thank you, Acting President. Uh, I move the motion as read. Thanks. Councillor Dillon as a seconder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting President. Just probably a um, little comment on this one, that it is uh, more about standardising and upgrading our uh, crossover arrangements for our residents around the Shire, so it, just to keep the place in uh, tip-top nick as we sort of 
move through the years. Thank you. Uh, is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? There is none. Councillor McCleary, happy to close debate or? Thank you, Acting President. Uh, look, there was a couple of things that I noticed that, uh, and I see walking around our yellow, there's a lot of houses being completed and I'm not sure that the numbers of crossovers that are being claimed are, are matching the number of houses being built. And I suspect that's because builders are just doing the crossovers and parts of that. So um, it's probably a good thing there, but this might get an influx of them in the near future. In favour? Uh, the item is carried unanimously. Sorry for turning off my microphone, but that was unanimous, and Councillor Terran Troy um, was in favour for those who were listening from home. Uh, item 14.2, drive through fast food premises, lot 217 Norton Promenade, Dayalup. Do I have a mover? Councillor Noonan and a seconder. Councillor McCleary. Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting President. I'd move the motion as read. Uh, Councillor McCleary is a seconder. Thank you, Mr President. Um, yeah, these are these are planning decisions. One would wonder whether we needed another one, but uh, it's in the appropriate uh, place. The planning uh, it ticks the boxes in the planning process. So um, I think this is just a, um, a point of yeah, look needs to happen. It, uh, one of the encouraging things that probably add a bit of employment into the local community, which is good, and I'm sure there's someone's got an appetite for this type of food, and they'll. Um, partake in the uh, wares that this business will provide. Thanks. Uh, is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? No? In that case, Councillor Noonan is the mover. Do you wish to close debate? Uh, thank you, Mr Acting President. Uh, I suppose for the people at home who are looking forward to another fast food option in, um, in Dalyalup, it, it is in fact for a chicken treat. And KFC. KFC. Councillor. Sorry, it's a, it's a week since I read that particular motion. Uh, the, but I, um, I'm, so it's uh, another option, and uh, I think that that's a good thing. The uh, other the point is that it's really good to see um, action and development happening in the commercial centre um, as we as we entered Dal Yellup and. Um, I think that that's a very promising sign for the Shire and for Daliella. Thank you, Councillor. Closing debate. Um, uh, so I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? And Councillor Tarantroy? In favour. Uh, the item is carried unanimously. Uh, item 14.3, intensification of ex existing tavern use, increasing patron, in patron numbers from 250 to 400, lot 70, 18 Portobello Road, Dale Up. Do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary, do I have a seconder? Councillor Noonan. Councillor McCleary, would you like to speak? Thank you, Acting President. I'll move the motion as read. Uh, I, I don't think it's adding too much issue. It's more about how, um, how the business will run and attract its patrons to it. Um, it gives it that extension of of the business and again provides um, a bit of local employment and it, it does have a bit of interest from the community of Dalyana. Uh Councillor Noonan. Uh, thank you Mr Acting President. I uh, also once again endorse the, um, the motion. I think it's good to see uh, that there is a meeting place in Dalyana for people to get together and um, enjoy some refreshments. It does concern me a little bit, the the numbers, and I fear that people might have to sit on the pool table um, and uh, really leaning over the over the bar to fit everyone in. However, we're in the adjoining documentation, it's, um, the point is made that it fits within the regulations, so that even though it looks and 
and is a big jump in the um, allowable patronage from 250 to 400. Uh, the point is that it, it does fit within the, the regulations and so I think that um, we would be um, placing ourselves in a difficult situation if we were not to accept it. So um, I'm quite happy to see that and I, I wish the, the tavern, the um, alehouse, all the best in attracting that sort of patronage on a regular basis. Is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? No? I guess I'll just add, um, yeah, it is, it, is a big, it is a big jump in numbers. Um, and, but I think at the end of the day, um, I think what's really important is allowing a business like the Tavern to have flexibility to conduct the business in the way that they want to and you know, make it more um, enticing for future people who want to have ideas and for future managers or owners or anything that have ideas around how they want to use the Tavern. I think it provides a lot more flexibility. Um, I think Councillor Noonan stated very clearly that obviously everything is, is well here in, in the eyes of the regulations. Um, I think there's, there's minor works in there for um, bathrooms and things like that to accommodate a larger number of people. So, um, I mean, I don't, don't have any major, don't really have any concerns on that front. Um, and so if this is what the, the, the operator thinks will provide them more flexibility and to run their business, I think um, in a, however better way they wish, I think that's a huge benefit for the community. So, um, yeah, very supportive of the recommendation. Um, is there any councillors who wish to speak on the item? Councillor McCleary is a mover. Would you like to close? Thank you, Mr President. Look, uh, I think sufficient has been said. Um, it complies. Um, the planning staff have done a, um, a very good job at reviewing this item. Thank you, Councillor McCleary. Um, I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? Uh, Councillor Terran Troy? In favour? That is passed unanimously. Mm -hmm. Item 14.4, and I have an amenders, amended officer's recommendation, uh, which is on the board, but for those following at home, um, change point one to endorses the 10 year plant replacement program 23-24 to 2032-33, as per the revised attachment 14.4.1 noting the amendment to the scheduling of greater plant replacements. Do I have a mover for that recommendation? Councillor McCleary and seconder, Councillor Mogg. Councillor McCleary, would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr President. I move the motion as read. Um, I do point out that um, some of the reasons for the amended sheet was to spread out the cost over a, a number of years, which is welcome. I um, also note that we're, our main concentration is in the upcoming budget of 23-24 and that, that's kind of been nailed down. Also within the body of the report, it shows that we're really looking at EVs in the near future if uh, certain things come through. Um, that's, that's a great outcome. We're sort of moving to that area. Um, so I, um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mulk. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. I'd just like to um, concur and to say it's a smart operations for our Shire to have this plan in progress um, and it, just to make function of operations and staff. Um, it, yeah, congratulations to staff. I'm very pleased to see this come forward, that there's something in the future and it's getting actioned. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? No, in that case, I'll give Councillor McCleary the opportunity to respond. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think it's all been said. Um, we'll put the motion. In that case, I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? Councillor Terran Troy? In favour. That is carried unanimously. Item 14.5, buoying up tip waiving fees. Do I have a mover? Councillor Dillon and a seconder, Councillor Mogg. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr Acting President. Not too much to say on this uh, motion. It's basically about helping out the uh, Boyne Up Foundation. 
uh, in terms of their ongoing upgrades at the uh, railway heritage grounds, etc., and building maintenance, that sort of thing, uh, just helping them with a bit of, um, uh, well, the cost of the refuse, I suppose, taking it to the, uh, the transfer station. So uh, I encourage all my fellow councillors to get behind it. Uh, Councillor Malt, do you have anything to add? No, reserve your right. Uh, is there any councillors who wish to speak? Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr President. Look, um, it is a, is a great item helping out the small group. Um, it's good to see that we've got a bit of review in the process of uh, waiving these fees and looking at the quantum and stuff like that. So hopefully we can get some changes in uh, what waste needs to go to different areas. Thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the item? No? Uh, Councillor Villain, you've got the right to reply if you'd like it. No, you're good. You might just want to button off your microphone. Thank you. Uh, in that case, I'll put it to a vote. All those in favour? Um, and Councillor Terentroy? In favour. So that was um, seven for one against. Councillor Andrew against. Sorry, six. Six one. Sorry, Councillor numbers changed up a little bit. Um, six, okay. All right, item 15.1, Shire of Cable Workforce Plan 23, uh, 2023 to 2026. Do I have a mover? Do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary and a seconder. Councillor Mogg, Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Acting President. Um, yeah, look, I'll move the motion as read. Um, it's got a lot of detail in it. There's a bit of comparison to other shires. I think that probably needs to be looked a bit more closely. Um, the details in the report, uh, it's good to see that there's some options for traineeships, uh, a bit of diversity, and um, I'll also note that there's a bit of it offshore if we can't get the technical people that we need in the Shire. It's trying times to actually get people into employment. You know, with low in unemployment rates, it makes it really hard to get staff. And as pointed out in it, with the different banding of Shires on either side of us, it, that also has an impact on the ability to attract staff. Um, but we seem to be going okay at the moment. And uh, I look forward to um, having a few more staff to come in and fill the voids that we've uh, missed in the last few years. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mogg is a seconder. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Basically, I'd just like to back and support what Councillor McCleary said. Thank you. Uh, is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr Acting President. Look, I just think it's important to point out to our residents and ratepayers that, uh, look, it is one of our biggest costs far and away in terms of the overall cost of running the Shire of Capel. But uh, this is a really, really good read in terms of... Uh, it's, it's a workforce plan. Um, so credit to the staff who've put it together. Um, we want, or I as a councillor, want our Shire to be a great place to work. Um, we want to make sure that it's an attractive place to stay once people are here. Um, there's not a great growth in terms of how many staff we're looking at putting on in the next uh, year or so, but um, it's, it's, it, I would encourage people to dig deep into it and have a bit of a read about what we're thinking of doing in the sort of you know, short to medium term. Um, and once again, credit to the Shire staff involved in putting it together. Thank you, Mr Acting President. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. Is there anyone, any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? Councillor Andrew. Uh, there's aspects of this workforce plan that I really like, the traineeships, the increase in diversity. Um, I even like some of the offshore stuff. Um, but then there's other aspects that there's just not enough detail in it for me. Um, I asked a couple of questions regarding the workforce plan prior to the meeting, um, the additional information I haven't received, um, and the working out the person that actually wrote the report now seems to have left, so there's some of the background, miss some of the background information and how this actually kind of all came together. Um, 
can't be found and isn't available. So I wish I could vote in favour of this tonight, um, but I just can't. There's too much missing for me. Councillor, did you want to put any of those questions to the forum through this avenue tonight in case you wanted some responses from senior staff um, in regards to some of those questions that you feel haven't been addressed yet? Or would you like to leave it there? All right, is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? No. Um, I'll just, I just want to quickly add, um, Councillor Dillon sort of touched on it, but over the time um, in local government, there's actually been quite a bit of criticism around such a large portion of how staffing takes up of our budget. But I think we are a small local government and we provide such an increasing and expanding array of services as the state government hands responsibilities down and new projects come on board um, and there's no doubt that the number one and best resource that we have as an organisation are the staff, um, no doubt. Um, and when I sat down with the CEO and discussed the workforce plan and, and discussed it with senior leadership, uh, with the senior team, um, you know, some of the things that came to mind were we could do, we can do better with um, our turnaround and our customer turnaround for, for planning. Uh, we can do better on a few things and I, I feel the planning resourcing um, is raised and addressed within the workforce plan um, and I think you know we have to invest in growing capacity in that area which is contained within this workforce plan if we're going to get better in that space. And, and, and the other thing was um, you know, my query was around the, the start thing, the couple of staff over the next um, years of the plan um, under the CEO's purview. And I mean, one of the ones, one of those is the is an economic development officer. I mean, we've got that economic development framework, um, and I think they are really important roles. Local government um, is always expanding further past roads, rates, and rubbish. Uh, and we've got to be able to deliver a service to our people and, and the best thing we can have and the best resource we've got is the staff and the people within the organisation. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I think a lot of those things to me, the, the planning staff and being able to um, process the planning applications, um, I think that's rel addressed, in the, addressed in the plan. Um, and I think it's great to see our initiatives, our vision around economic development and those things coming in under the, the CEO's wings and getting some notice from a, a, a staffing allocation perspective as well in the future. So um, that's it from me. Is there any councillors who wish to speak on the item before I give it to anyone? No. Um, in that case, I'll give it to Councillor McCleary for the right of reply. Thank you, Mr Acting President. Um, look, lots of good things have been said. Some concerns have been raised, and I acknowledge those. Um, this report feeds into a whole lot of other reports, strategic plans, uh, long-term financial plans and where we're heading with that. We've seen some developments in the past where we've brought stuff in-house like the gardening and landscaping in Dalyella and that's part of a, an increase in workforce with the outcome that we hope to uh, save a bit of money in that area as well. Um, I think technology is coming into the game a lot more so we need a, a bit of a change in workforce which is identified in the plan. So uh, look, I fully uh, think this this plan is a, is a good plan as it starts. Uh, it'll probably adjust over time as well as we get to learn a bit more and probably address the concerns that were raised here tonight. Um, so that's my end. I'll put that to a vote. Those in favour? Uh, and Councillor Terran Troy? Oh, sorry, and sorry, I'll just say those against? In uh, favour? And Councillor Terran Troy in favour, that is carried 6 1. Did I get my numbers right that time? Yep. All right, item 15.2 2023 uh, 24 draft annual budget fees and charges schedule. Do I have a mover? Councillor Mogg, do I have a seconder? Councillor Noonan. Councillor Mogg. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I'll read the motion as read and thank the officers and work done to put this forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Noonan. No, it's nothing to add. 
Is there any councillors who wish to speak on the item? No? Give Councillor Mogg the right of reply. No? In that case, I'll put this to a vote. Those in favour? Those against? Councillor Terentroy? In favour? That is carried 6-1. Item 15.3, accounts paid during the month of April 2023. Do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary, do I have a seconder? Councillor Dillon. Councillor McCleary. You've Just moved the motion as read. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. And the seconder, Councillor Dillon? Yeah. Nothing. Uh, is there any councillors who wish to speak on the item or have any questions? No? Councillor McCleary, you've got the right of reply. No, you're all good. All right, I'll put that to a vote. Those in favour? Uh, and Councillor Terentroy? In favour. That is carried unanimous. Item 15.4, financial reports for the 31st of March 2023. Uh, do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Andrew? Councillor McCleary. I move the motion is read. Uh, there's there's a lot of words in there. I'll probably bring up the old kettlefish, but this is the March figures. Uh, we're tracking a little bit behind on capital, so hopefully that improves a little bit by the end. But we're projecting a, an underspend this year, and that's understandable under the economic process that we're heading with that. Uh, Councillor Andrew, uh, is there any councillors who wish to speak on the item? No, Councillor McCleary does have the right to reply. He's all good. I'll put that to a vote. Those in favour? Councillor Terentroy? In favour. That is carried unanimous. Item 15.5, policy review corporate credit and debit cards. And I note that there is a small change in the officer's recommendation. So if you are moving this let me know if you're moving something otherwise, but otherwise the motion is um, amended to include noting the amended limit of $5,000 for the emergency services debit card. Do I have a mover? Do I have a, I'll ask Councillor McCleary and a seconder, Councillor Noonan. Councillor McCleary. Uh, I move the motion is read. Um, it's important that we have um, corporate credit cards to make some of the payments and I, I do note the extra dollars in the Bush Fire Brigade part that was amended yeah. and um, which is kind of urgent at times when they need it and we, I think we had some commentary a few months back on that one. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Noonan. Uh, yes, thank you Mr Acting President. I suppose for the listeners at home, the, just explaining the nature of the requirement for, or the, yeah, the requirement for the increase in the um, emergency services limit to be increased from 1,000 to 5,000. In, in the event of a, on a weekend, if we had a big emergency with a fire, earthquake, flood or, or whatever, and we have to feed, uh, provide fuel, um, accommodation, all sorts of things that we, we might have to do for volunteers or for people um, in situations where they have certain in, um, requirements, then we need to have that flexibility. So I think that the, um, that, that increase in the emergency services limit is justified. And, um, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Noonan. Is there any other councillors who wish to contribute to the debate? Uh, Councillor Andrew? Thank you. I have a question first. If I ask, oh sorry, if I ask a question, like a proper question, can I then move an amendment still? So asking a question is not considered your opportunity okay. for speaking, so you'll still have the chance to move an amendment. Perfect. So if you'd like to ask your question through the chair. I do, through you. How many credit cards do we currently have circulating? Uh, so I'll refer that question to the Director of Infrastructure and Development. Oh, sorry, oh, to the community and corporate. Thank you, through the presiding member. 
So the CEO has a credit card, the manager of finance has a credit card, the director, myself, has a credit card, director of infrastructure and development has a credit card. So that's, oh, so the answer is yeah, four credit cards. Well, that's the debit card. Actually. Five. So the answer yeah. is five, is five cards. So I have a follow-up question. Follow-up question, yeah. So if I look at the accounts paid during this month, for example, there's one credit card listed as EFT42357, and there's a whole list of transactions that have occurred. It has all those transactions been on one singular credit card, or do we amalgamate all the credit card purchases and list them as business credit card expenses in the accounts payable? Yep, payable. I'll refer that question to the um, Director of Community and Corporate. Yeah, so basically the credit card statements come in under each individual card, card holder. Um, and then they're amalgamated. Thank you. So I have an amendment to this policy, if I could. Yep, if you'd like to tell us your amendment. So my amendment is to point number 18, which currently says a list of credit card transactions shall be included in the list of accounts paid to council. What I would like to amend that to is that the credit card transactions are actually identified per credit card in that list. So can I suggest then that you just simply add to the end of the question, end of this, that line 18? Um, oh, I'm not sure that that's exactly how I wanted it to read. That's just yeah. what I was explaining. Okay. Can that's we... very bad English. I can do better <laughs> than that. Um, just hold on, a list of credit card transactions that will be included in the list of account page. Um, I'm just... So what I would envisage, if we jump into Cara's head, is in that accounts payable list would be Bendigo Bank credit card whose credit card it is, and then all their transactions. So that would be under one EFT number. Then someone, the next person's credit card would have a different EFT number, identify whose credit card it is, and the list of transactions. So we'd end up with a breakdown of the five separate. Yeah, so councillor, yep. so, that's, so that's understood. Uh, but for you to get put the amendment on the table, we need to <coughs> finalise the exact wording of what you would like point 18 to say. Um, and so perhaps that is a list of credit card transactions shall be included uh, in the list of accounts paid to council, um, identifying which card. I'm, you'll have to have to work with me on exactly what. List of credit card transactions. I'm going to refer this to CEO for advice on wording for the yeah. amendment. Uh, through your acting shy president, maybe if <coughs> Councillor Andrew is comfortable with the wording that um, accounts paid and reported to council reference individual transactions to individual credit cards held within the organisation. Did you get that? So <laughs> I, I will. We will just. We will just give the CEO the op the um, minute taker the opportunity to get the amendment written down. Um, and then we will seek a seconder once we have an official, we have an amendment. because we don't have any microphones on it, it doesn't think there's any audio. That's all right. 
All right, so Councillor Andrew, your amendment wording is finalised. You're moving the amendment as written, amendment to point 18, and changing it to individual transactions reported to council as accounts paid to itemise to individual credit cards held within the organisation. You're moving that amendment. Yep, do I have a seconder for that amendment? Yeah, Councillor Noonan. Um, Councillor Andrew, you have the right to, you've, you're, you've got the floor. Uh, I just think that this probably cleans the reading of the accounts payable up a little bit. Um, being able to go back and, and actually review um, who's spending what. I um, also think it makes it easier to for any auditing processes or, I don't know, pure councillor curiosity. Um, I just think that it's a, it's a more countable, it's a more accountable um, way of keeping a track of who's spending what on, on our organisation credit cards. Uh, councillor Noonan. Uh, yeah, I, I agree entirely. Thank you. Is there any other councillors who wish to make a contribution to the amendment or to the discussion? No? In that case, the mover does have the right of reply. Do you need a second opportunity? No? All right. I will put the amendment uh, to amend point 18, individual transactions reported to council as accounts paid to itemise to individual credit cards held within the organisation. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Councillor Terran Troy? In favour. Uh, the amendment is uh, carried unanimously uh, and that becomes the subsequent motion uh, with I point 18 amended. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the subsequent <coughs> item? No? In that case, uh, I give the right of reply to Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, I thank Councillor Andrew for that amendment. Um, whilst I, I think it's uh, a very audited process with credit cards, because I know from having one when I was working at the Water Corporation, um, this process is uh, more transparent in giving it to the accounting list. So I, I thank you for that, and I put the motion. All right, put that to a vote. All those in favour? And Councillor Terran Troy? In favour. Uh, and that is carried unanimously. Item 15.6, delegation review tenders. Do I have a mover? Mover, delegation review tenders. Councillor Mogg? Do I have a seconder? Councillor McCleary? Councillor Mogg? Thank you, Deputy Chair. I accept the motion as read. Thank you. Councillor McCleary. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Councillor Mogg. Um, look, this is um, adding a little bit more efficiency to the process of, of purchasing, which I think is good. We still control a lot of things through the budget process and where they're spent and uh, other tenders. Thanks. Is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? No, in that case, Councillor Mogg, you do have the right of reply. No? All right, all those in favour? And Councillor Tarantroy? In favour. That is carried unanimously. Item 16, new business of an urgent nature. There is one. Uh, item 16.1. Uh, was mentioned at, at the front, yep. Um, okay, so we have um, new business of urgent nature, 16.1, um, and there is two officers' recommendations. The first officer's recommendation that council revokes decision OC 2022-232 uh, from the ordinary meeting of council on the 30th of November 2022 will require an absolute Majority, as it is a 
decision to revoke council decision. So we're not in, because um, we're not in discussion, I probably can't have a, because um, we're not in an item, can't have a discussion at the moment. Sorry. Um, I'm just seeking advice on whether or not there needed to be a Councillors, I was just confirming that we did not need a motion in order to get the recommendations on the table to, to open the discussion for an urgent uh, business of an urgent nature. And I can confirm that um, under part four business of meeting that that is not necessary. Uh, and so I'm looking for a mover for officers recommendation one. Do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary, do I have a seconder? Councillor Dillon, Councillor McCleary. I uh, move the motion as read. Councillor Dillon, is there any councillors who wish to contribute to the debate? Councillor Andrew. So you have to um, get out of the agenda and go to the list of agendas for this year. And I believe that somewhere at the top, there will be new business of an urgent nature, EI. Yep. And also the other motions as well. Um, um, I'll take that as a question, so I'll still give you the opportunity to contribute to discussion if you wish, but do you, yep, no, no worries, yeah, and it was, yeah, sorry, that's where it is on Docs on Tap and I understand that councillors have also had an emailed version as well. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak on the item, officer's recommendation one? No, I'll give it to Councillor McCleary, he's got the right of reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think this is an important thing um, dealing with dealing with some SAT indications on, on the process of a uh, um, protective industry licence and we need to act on it in a reasonable time. All right, uh, noting that it needs an absolute majority, I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? Uh, and against? So that's four, two. Councillor Terentroy? Oh. So that is carried. 5-2, which is an absolute majority, yeah. as 5 is the absolute majority. Yeah. And I'll just note that um, for the minutes that uh, 4 was Councillor Dillon, McCleary, Noonan, Schiano, and Terentroy, and against was Councillor Andrew and Councillor Bog. Moving on to officers' recommendation number 2, um, do I have a mover? Councillor McCleary, do I have a seconder? Councillor Dillon. Councillor McCleary, you've got the floor. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, look, I think this is uh, one of those classifications. Well, we need to make the change. It will be up to this council to make that change, um, as suggested by the staff of the council. Uh, Councillor Dillon. Uh, is there any councillors who wish to add to the discussion on this item? Councillor Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting President. I think probably it, some uh, viewers at home who haven't got access to Docs on Tap might be wondering, you know, what's, what's actually being um, debated here? What's the motion about? And um, so just to clarify, I'm, uh, and I'm in in favour of the the, um, the second recommendation, uh, it it's to deal with the uh, access to the quarries, um, 
particularly in relation to the truck movements on Jules Road and a number of trucks. So um, that's that's basically the the the, um, the substance of the um, of the motion and uh, what it does. It provides for a maximum of 188 truck movements, so 94 to 94 from per day in accordance with the traffic management plan agreed in writing by the CEO and supported by a traffic impact statement upon completion of the internal hall road and crossover to Hasty Road, no truck movements or transporting uh, of the extracted material are permitted on Jules Road other than for direct local deliveries. So I think particularly for those people living in the area it's just um, it's confirmation that that is going ahead it's uh, acknowledging that to do otherwise would probably be inviting a an appeal it's set um, I think that it's a um, a reasonable compromise given the amount of um, material that is required and the demands on the um, basalt resources that are there particularly at the moment so I uh, uh, and once again, acknowledging that when the road is completed and when Hasty is closed and the new, well, the new access to the quarry is made, life will be better for, particularly for those residents living in proximity to the quarries. So I think this is a good thing. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any other councillors who wish to add to the discussion? Councillor Andrew. Thank you. Um, only to say that I completely disagree um, with the officer comment um, that says that it is difficult to argue objectively that the 78 um, that the truck increases um, aren't going to affect the amenity or the road safety outcomes. Um, we are going from 78 to 188 um, over a 10 hour working period. That is over 18 truck movements an hour from this one quarry. And the other issue is that this is compounding. It's not just this quarry, it's the other 30 that we heard about during questions during question time today. And it's the other quarry that has another 15 or another 20, and it's this compounding effect. Um, I personally didn't think that the conditions that we imposed in condition H originally were too arduous. Um, all that was required was <coughs> a phone call or an email to the CEO, um, and he had the authority to authorise an increase in truck movements. In what might be a telling tale of what kind of a parent I was, or am, I actually likened this to a child having a tantrum. Um, I didn't give in to my ch own children having a tantrum, and I won't be giving in to this quarry operator who's having a tantrum because they don't want to send an email to the CEO requesting an increase in truck movement. Um, particularly when this is to the detriment of the localised community um, and the users of Hasty's Road. Um, so I will not be voting in favour um, of this amended motion. Uh, is there any other councillors who wish to contribute to the discussion? No. Uh, I will just take the opportunity to speak now then. Um, I think there is, I, I, it wasn't that long ago that we had this discussion um, when the item came to council I mean, a couple of months ago and um, I remember Councillor Andrew and I being quite adamant that uh, to get the question, to get the answers out of the applicant and staff around the movements of trucks and the natures of the movements of trucks. Um, I think it's worth clarifying though that it was, it's 70-something um, in and 70-something out so it's a hundred and it's uh, more of 150-odd truck movements 
um, going up to 188 truck movements, not 75 going to going to 188. Um, and I think the other thing that really stood out for me in the first discussion we had was understanding that not all of these trucks are, are entering onto Hastie's Road and they're not all utilising Hastie's Road to do their, their local deliveries. There was about three different, there was about three different um, routes that they go on um, and Hastie's Road was definitely, it didn't have necessarily the most in the way that the majority of trucks weren't going down there but I mm -hmm. think it was a, the larger group of the, of the routes from memory. What I think we've really got here is a bit of a full circle because ultimately we're sort of back at the same truck numbers than what we were when we were having that discussion the other month. Um, I, I mean, that was a, a difficult decision to make back then. Uh, it doesn't make this decision any easier. But uh, I think when I, and we talk about the objective nature of our, somewhat subjectively, um, I don't quite see the truck movements being as onerous as what has somewhat been explained at times given that these trucks aren't all going down Hastie's Road and of course when the outer ring road and the connection there is complete the requirement requires them to no longer use that connection. So knowing that um, and then also adding into the equation the actual need for the, um, the traffic assessment to be paired with any increase in, in trucks, I actually think that we've ended up in a better situation than we were going into the original meeting talking about the same number of trucks. So it, I think it definitely is an improvement. Um, I, yeah, I think that um, there's a lot of things to take into consideration here. I think all of today's conversations with, um, within this meeting through question time, and it's been mentioned, have been about how industry plays um, with, with community. Uh, and it's an incredibly challenging balance to strike um, and you know we have to try and mitigate the best way we can within the, the provisions and the policies and the local laws that we've got um, and I, I don't necessarily think that um, we are able to win this one. Um, obviously this is the opportunity, this has come back, this has gone to SAT, we've been given the opportunity to reconsider our position um, and I think the position that we've got here is an improvement over the position that we had before we got there. So I like to think of that as a little bit of a win, bit of a half uh, cup half full in this situation. Um, so I will be supporting the officer's recommendation tonight. Is there any other councillors who wish to speak on the item? No. In that case, I'll give it to Councillor McCleary for the right of reply. Thank you, Acting President, and thank you, Cara, for your input. Look, it is. Um the numbers of trucks are maximums. They're not an everyday movement of trucks, so that's some of the consideration. In the other thing is, uh, over the life of this quarry, the exit will be on to Hasty Road eventually, and that's the way it'll be delivering to the area. There's probably a large quantity of this material going to the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, and uh, that's probably the general gist of where it will head. Um, we got to wear it because uh, of the people that live on Jules Road, but we're in a position where we could reject this tonight and then still find that uh, a lesser outcome comes. So uh, it's possibly the lesser of two evils that we're, we're voting on. So I'm, I'm in favour of the motion that's uh, in front of us at the moment. Uh, I'll put this to a vote. Those in favour? Those against? And Councillor Terentroy? Four. Okay. Uh, so that is carried. Sorry. Five two. The numbers are different on me every time I chair one of these meetings. <laughs> we go from nine eight. Seven. Um. All right. Item seventeen: public question time. Is there anyone in the gallery from the floor who has any questions? No. All right. I, uh, 18, motions without notice. Uh, there are none, unless there are any motions without notice from Council. No. Notices of motion for consideration at the next ordinary meeting of the Council. Is there any? No. Items for consideration behind closed doors. There is none. And I declare the meeting closed at 8.34pm.
Yeah, what was the sweeps, Dave? Yeah, when you go for it. I'll ask. <laughs> 